perception is reality, isn't it? Is that something you heard a lot of times? We, we hear that often. I've heard it time before, probably said it. Um, a lot of times, though, it, we almost, it's shifted into like a negative thing. It's like, you know, you, you know you shouldn't be doing something. We have these assumptions about things. It's like, well, you know, I'm not going to talk about that thing. But, you know, perception is reality. So the implication is like, you need to get your act together because perception is reality. But we're going to find out that um, we shift so much of our, our thinking through our perception and the way we see things, the way we view things. And even um, sort of modern examples, when we look back into historical figures, we seem to change our perception on people like founding fathers and people in our history. For example, Thomas Jefferson. What if I told you, and maybe you've heard this, that Thomas Jefferson, he had a Bible, he took the Bible, and he began to mark things out, tear it up, cut things out of the Bible, and he took out all the miraculous things, all the sort of spiritual things. He sort of took that out, and he then pieced it back together, and he created the Thomas Jefferson Bible. And we would all probably agree, that's terrible. Why would someone do that? That's, that's horrible. But maybe your perception might change if I gave you just a little bit more information. What if I told you Thomas Jefferson actually had a heart for the Native American? He loved the Native American. He wanted to reach them with the gospel. And what if I told you that he, although maybe misguided, Maybe not the right way to go about it, but he wanted to reach them, and he thought, well, maybe we can't reach them with just giving them the whole Bible. There's a lot in there. It's confusing. Their context completely different. It's hard to understand. Maybe the miracles, they won't accept it, but what if we created this pamphlet, and it was on the moral teachings of Jesus of Nazareth? What if we gave that to them and used it as a tool to reach them with the gospel, like a step to get them a little bit closer? If I tell you that, doesn't that just completely change your perception when you just have a little bit more information about some things that, that maybe was excluded, maybe was kept from us a little bit? And we're going to get into that, and we're going to find out from disi some disciples that that's the exact thing that happened. And I want to say welcome. My name is Scott, one of the pastors here, and we've been going through a study called Follow Me. And as you saw on the screen, there were all these different people, and you, there's countless examples of historical figures, maybe religious leaders or political leaders, and they basically said, follow me. They had a teaching, they had a philosophy, they had a way of doing things, and it was basically, follow me. But Jesus actually said the same thing, and Jesus said that constantly to many people, many of his disciples. He always said, follow me. And, and they would come along, and they, I have a way to teach you. I have a way to follow, and, and you can have a new life in me. And he said, follow me. And we're going to see in that that there's some different um, perceptions that begin to change, and we're going to learn that your perception determines your direction. The things that you perceive about something is actually going to change the way that you go the way that you walk. And we're going to literally walk through, uh, as some disciples literally walk, we're going to figuratively walk through some things that they learned as well. And just to kind of get the context of, of what is happening here, uh, the, the disciples, so Jerusalem had this big festival. Like nobody came to Jerusalem because they're like, oh, great, Jesus is going to die for my sins. And then he's going to raise again. Nobody had that on their radar. Jesus was the only one. No one had, there was no concept in the Jewish mind that there would be a, a Messiah that would die in a brutal, evil way by the hands of our enemies and, and that he would rise again. Like that was not even in the consciousness of the disciples, of any of the Jews. No one had that on the radar at all, but that's what happened. And we're going to walk through some disciples that they're actually walking away. And we're going to see that, that they actually begin to walk away because 
the, Jerusalem would have been completely overwhelmed by all the Jews that would have come into the city because they're going to make sacrifices. They're, they're going to be there for Passover. And there'll be the Passover lamb that is sacrificed. And we see, we know that Jesus is the sacrifice. Jesus becomes that Passover lamb. He, his blood covers all of our sins. That anybody who puts their faith in Jesus can have a new life no matter where you are, no matter how far away you are from him. And as I was just reading back through this, God showed me something new that I'd never seen before, that I, I've read this probably hundreds of times, and it's a story about these disciples on the road to Emmaus. And what I learned in here is that God is for those who are walking away. God is actually for those people who are walking away. Probably some people in here as well. And if we're honest, probably all of us to some degree or another, maybe there's some element in us, we're questioning some things. Things didn't work out the way that we thought, and, and maybe we're holding back, or maybe, maybe we're walking away. Maybe it's totally, you're like, this is nonsense, and I'm walking away. What, what you think about God, I don't know. But here's what I do know. God is for the people who are walking away. And we're going to see some disciples that this very thing happens. And the first thing getting into this is you need to know where are, your, are you walking. Because some di disciples that are walking away. And uh, Jesus would amass tens of thousands of people at one time. We you hear about the feeding of the 5,000 or 4,000 but that was just heads of household. There were probably fifteen to 20,000 people Jesus would amass at a gathering. But we come to find out a little bit later that there was maybe only about 120 people that really followed Jesus. There were a lot of people that would gather, but just a few people that actually followed. And two of them are walking away. And we're going to see what happens here. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 24, we're going to be in verse, starting in verse 13. Remember, that at this point, we are in the third day. Jesus has risen from the grave. But not everybody knew that yet. Not everybody was following that. Not even all the disciples. And we're going to see in here that uh, most of the disciples, and even these disciples that walked away, had this information. They had all the same evidence, but they had a different perception. Because they learned, and we're going to see that our perception determines our direction. So verse 13, it says, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So probably not many of us are from Israel I didn't grow up in Jerusalem. So I want to give a little context of what this looks like. Um, it was uh, west, kind of northwest of Jerusalem. They would have all come here for this big festival, the Passover, major holiday in the Jewish world. So they all would have come to Jerusalem. But at this point, it's been a few days. Now they're beginning to leave the city. And all the, the actual disciples that stayed with Jesus, that stayed true. They, they didn't hear what, what else are we supposed to do. All Jesus said was to come here, so we followed him. There's about 120, but then two of them walk away, and they're going maybe to their hometown. Maybe they're going back. We don't know exactly their story, but they're not following Jesus at this point. They're walking away. And it was about seven miles away. And, and there's something interesting here that you see is that maybe you've been in an environment like this where um, people are maybe worshiping. And they're, this is the most amazing thing ever. But at the same time, there's other people like, I don't know about this. And they're maybe mentally or spiritually, I'm walking away. And you see that two different views, and, and you see that the, the disciples actually had all this information. They knew the, the tomb was empty. And then we, see, we could almost juxtapose those two. This is the third day. This should be exciting. But because of these two disciples, their perception was they were still living in day two. They were still living in this sort of tragedy and then tension. 
they had some questions. They, they weren't sure about this. They had some doubts, and, but God is going to walk with them in this. And it reminds me of um, what's actually going to happen in, in a little bit at Jesus' ascension, where you can have all the same information, but because of your perception, because maybe the things you want to happen, you go in completely different directions. And Pastor Drew is going to talk about this next week a little bit more on the ascension, so make sure you come back for that. It's going to be an amazing sermon. But Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, this is what this is talking about right before Jesus is going to ascend. It says, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And isn't that the case that because of your perception, because of our perception, the things that we see, and ultimately we're going to see the things that we want to happen, if they don't, we go in completely different directions. But God is with you in your doubt. I want you to hear that. God is with you in your doubt. Because if we're honest, there's some area, there's some element, there's something that we thought would happen, we thought it would work out one way, and it doesn't, and maybe we're walking away. But God is with you in your doubt, and we're going to see that in verse 15. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near to them. Don't you love Jesus? Don't you just love that? They're, like, you got to get what's happening here. They are leaving, like they're walking away from Jesus. But Jesus is walking after them. Jesus is kind of coming up, like he hasn't revealed himself, he hasn't talked. And, and the Bible even talks about, for some reason, that their eyes kept them from seeing him. Maybe this is a spiritual thing. I don't know. But maybe it was just their perception. Maybe it was something that just went out of the blue. This wasn't supposed to happen. This wasn't the way it was supposed to go down. They didn't recognize him. So everybody's leaving, kind of come up. And then Jesus is walking next to them. And he's, he's hearing this conversation. But they're not addressing him yet. They're, they're just listening. Jesus is just listening. They're discussing all their doubts, all their pains, all their issues, all the things that are happening, but they're being open and honest and talking about it. They probably have some anger, anger to God. I don't know. They probably have some doubts like, God, why didn't you do this? What, I thought we were supposed to fall. Now, how are we going to pick up our lives? Something went terribly wrong. How are we going to live our lives? How are we going to pick up our lives? Because you have to see what they, they didn't just, oh, I want to follow Jesus and everything was the same. They gave up everything. They would have likely given up their livelihood, given up sort of their cultural family affiliation, because likely many of their other family didn't follow. They gave up everything. They probably left their job. I'm following Jesus. We don't know at what year in Jesus' three-year ministry did they start following. We don't know. But they were somewhat connected. They were somewhat connected even with the closest disciples. But Jesus is walking along with them. And also, we don't know at what point Jesus kind of comes alongside them. Maybe he was walking with them the whole time. But we know that Jesus drew near. I love that. Even with, you have to get this, even with them walking away, whatever that is for you and for me, walking away, maybe going back into some sinful lifestyle or some sinful area, but walking away, but Jesus is drawn near. He's for the people who walk away. And I love how God's word says the same thing, you know, in verse 15, where it talks about they were discussing Jesus drew near. James chapter 4, verse 8 repeats the same thing. Come near to God and he will come near to you. That's a promise. And then in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. This is Old Testament, 400 years before Jesus came, God in the flesh came to this earth 400 years before that, there was a prophet named Malachi, and it was the last one before the New Testament, before Jesus would come. And he said this, those who feared the Lord talked with each other, and the Lord listened, and he heard. I love that, that just as they're talking, as they're discussing, as God is on our lips, as we're speaking his name, even if it's in our doubts, 
he's still drawing near to us. God's word is clear on that. And we see how Jesus sort of enters into our life as he did with the disciples. But then we're about to see how Jesus opens us up. He reveals some assumptions that we have, and he's going to do it through questions. And and the first question we need to ask, and he's going to answer, is what are you wanting? It's the things you want to change your perception, and then your perception determines your direction. And Jesus is revealing assumptions. Actually, it's recorded um, over 300 times that Jesus asked questions in the Gospels. 300 times. Yeah, he makes some statements, but he's not wondering what's happened. He's trying to reveal with us what's happening. When we begin to open up our own assumptions by asking those difficult questions about the doubts we actually have that maybe we try to hide, or maybe those things that didn't work out we try to hide, but God is revealing that, and that's exactly what he's going to be doing here. And so they're walking along. Jesus is It's just listening. They're talking. And then verse 17, it says, Jesus then begins to speak up. And he says, what's this conversation that you're talking about? They knew that Jesus was a Jew. Like, they didn't know it was Jesus. They somehow was kept from him. But they must have been thinking, are you serious? What happened? The person that our people have been praying for for thousands of years, the Messiah, remember like a week ago, he came into town, we put palm branches down, we were worshiping him, the kids were worshiping, like everybody, it was about to happen. The thing that we prayed for, the thing that we've been longing for was about to happen, What do you mean, what are we talking about? Because Jesus is close and he can hear. It's like, you know what we're talking about. And and the Bible even talks about that they're walking along and then they're sad and they just stop. If you've ever been through a tragedy, and and some people haven't, but just live long enough. It comes for everybody. But they're walking and then they just stop. And they look sad. And one of them, one of the disciples, we don't know um, both their names, but one of them is Cleopas, and he said in verse 18, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened these days? Like all the Romans, all the Jews, like everybody knows what happened. They killed an innocent man. And we thought he was going to be the Messiah. That's what we thought. And Jesus, I love how Jesus just presses a little bit. You ever had God speak into your life? Maybe it's through other people, but he just presses a little bit more, a little bit more. And then he continues and says, 19, what things? It's like, dude, seriously. Okay, Jesus, like, I thought I explained this. And he, he digs deeper because he's trying to reveal those deeper assumptions because your perception determines your direction. And Jesus knows that. So he's opening up their assumptions. And I love God's word. He even shows us this. The psalmist is is doing the same thing where he's asking God to, he's inviting him in to open me up. Psalm 139, 23 says, search me God and know my heart and test me and know my anxious thoughts. God knows you have anxious thoughts. God knows you have doubts and worries and you have some things that didn't work out the way they were supposed to or you thought that they were supposed to. But he's saying, invite me in. Know my anxious thoughts. And he answers the question in verse 19. Okay, Jesus, I'll, or he didn't know he's Jesus, but okay, strange man, I'm never going to ask your name because this is just weird. I'm just in this devastating situation, never asked his name, but he said, okay, I'll answer your question, verse 19, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, and this is what reveals what he wants, because he reveals the perception that he has in Jesus. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was, past tense, 
a prophet only. Mighty in word and deed between God and all people. We thought he was going to be this way. He, he was a prophet. He was a great man of God. He, he was maybe even the Messiah, but he's dead. That's not working out so well. And we see this is the, a key part, and this can help absolutely everybody. The next verse in 21, where he reveals what he actually wants and what he thinks he was robbed of. But we had hoped he would be the one to redeem Israel. We had some expectations of Jesus, and he failed us. We thought it was going to work out this way, but it didn't. We did everything he said. We followed the rules. We followed him. We, we did everything we were supposed to do. But this is how it turned out. We'd hoped that it would be this way. And in summary, verse 22 and 24, we see clearly that they had all the evidence of the empty tomb. They even report back to this man who's Jesus. They don't know this yet. They report back to him. Yeah, well, some of the women went to the tomb and they said it was empty. They report that back and, and they talk about angels and all these miraculous things. But they're saying, but we don't know. I don't, and clearly, they have a perception. Why? Because their direction is indicating their perception. And they had some unrealized expectations. I think this can help all of us. There's sort of a view of this because basically it, it says something happened, but we had hoped. So fill in the blanks, whatever those things are, something happened. Some tragedy happened, some issue happened, somebody didn't treat you right, whatever it was, something happened. But then, this is what I hope for, a couple examples, maybe a loss of friendship happened, a relationship ended, something happened. But I'd hoped this would be the acceptance that I always wanted. I thought this would be it. Or, or maybe um, divorce happens. I didn't plan for it, but divorce happened. But I'd hoped this would be the one. I'd hoped this was going to be it. Or maybe that thing came back up and relapse happened. Maybe that's a substance. Maybe that's a, a food. Maybe that's pornography. Maybe that's sexual relationship. Maybe that's that broken relationship that you know it's not good for you, but you keep, it just happened. Relapse happened. But I'd hoped I could manage it. I thought I was over it. But that happened. And there's a, some ways that I think can kind of help us through this and give us sort of a framework that can help us work through some of these things that are unrealized expectations. And virtually all conflict, whether that's internal Questions you have, issues you have, expectations you thought you had, or maybe it's conflict externally. Someone treated you a certain way or acted a certain way, but all conflict comes from unrealized expectations. We had some expectations of some people or maybe of ourselves, or maybe like these disciples, they had some expectations of God, but he didn't deliver because they had some assumptions about how he should act. We hoped he'd be the one, but they clearly believe, obviously, he wasn't. So there's a framework. The first thing that might be helpful is to first just figure out what in the world happened. What happened? The disciples did this. They, they had some unrealized expectations. A tragedy happened. Okay, what happened? Let's just talk about it. Let's evaluate it. Let's be honest about what happened. And the next thing, which is so crucial to our perception, is what does it mean? We even do this if someone said something, and then we take that at it with our perception. 
oh, because they said this, because that relationship ended this way, I'm no good. I'm worthless. I'm less than. All these things, that's where we take it the wrong way. So what does it actually mean? The disciples thought it meant, well, God failed. Let's be honest. That's what they thought. God failed. I was supposed to get this. This was supposed to happen. But God didn't come through. Jesus didn't come through. It didn't work out the way that I thought. And the last thing, crucial thing, is what are you going to do about it? Based on all that, what happened to me? What does it mean? Let's perceive it correctly. And then what am I going to do about it? Which direction am I going to go? Because we go through this process, whether we know it or not, and the direction we go reveals what we want. It reveals what we think is going to bring us comfort. No one falls back into sin because they think it's bad and I want to do bad things. No one does that. No one intentionally is trying to walk away from God. But they, they fall into it because they think it's going to bring them some sort of comfort. That's what the disciples were doing. They weren't thinking, oh, I'm leaving God, I'm rejecting God, I'm turning away from him. They're like, well, I'm going to go back to my hometown. i got to put the pieces back together. i got to try to find a job. i got to work things out. That's what they're trying to do. So go through this framework. That can be helpful. Maybe if it's something you've been through in the past, or if not, you will go through something in the future. But Jesus is going to show the most important thing is we need to know what the disciples are going to find out is who are you walking with? Because that changes everything if you know who's walking with you. And they're going to find that out. And um, Jesus actually in this, the Bible talks about Jesus is um, acting like he's going to keep going because it's getting late in the day and they're, they're discussing, okay, we need to probably get to our town and we need to eat some food. You know, we need to settle in. And Jesus acting like he's going to walk, and then they invite him in. It's, you know, it's probably like after you guys finish the service, you'll be, uh, you know, acting like you're leaving. Like, I hope they invite me to eat. <laughs> and they're like, hey, will you come with? Oh, yeah, I mean, I had other plans. But yeah, I'll, I'll cancel that, and I'll just go with, yeah, sure. And that's what Jesus does. Like, he acts like. He's going to keep going. But then they invite him in to their home. And that's where Jesus opens their eyes. Because something very familiar. You ever had that deja vu moment where like something you're like, that's familiar. And Jesus does something that he does very often. And the Bible talks about he's revealing the scriptures to him. He's talking with them. He's explaining how all the Old Testament scriptures point to him explain why Jesus was supposed to die. All the things Jesus has been telling them, which they didn't believe, that the Messiah is going to die for your sins and give you a new life. And you get to walk in that freedom, in that new life. And he explains to all the prophets, all the law, all the Old Testament, how it points to Jesus. And then he does something familiar. And he takes some bread and he breaks it. And then he hands it to the disciples. And the Bible talks about, then he disappears. Like he has a new glorified body, something to look forward to in heaven. New resurrected body, he can just disappear, I guess, when he wants. I don't know. But that's what happens. He just vanishes from their sight. But they realize, oh, wait, that's Jesus. Okay, that looks familiar. You got the bread. Yeah, that's familiar. And then... It explains something that is so crucial that we can all take away from that. In verse 32, and it says, And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while we talked on the road? And while he opened the scriptures. Not just while we're in the presence of them, not just when we're around, but when we opened the scriptures. And Pastor Drew talked about this a few weeks ago, that Proximity to Jesus doesn't necessarily mean closeness to Jesus. But I love that, that it's not just, oh, yeah, well, they had Jesus, like, back in Bible times. Like, he's saying, no, this is for you. This is now. This is how you can get close to Jesus. Just like them, your heart can burn within you from the Scriptures. And he'll 
waken you and make you alive in him. And he shows you that that's how you get to do it because they realize that their perception determine their direction. So that's why you open the scriptures. That's why you get in God's word because you have the right perception about who God really is. And something happens is they change everything. They change their direction. Verse 33 And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11, and they were gathered together saying, verse 34, the Lord has risen indeed. See how they completely radically changed their direction. I can't find in the Bible where someone gives their life to Jesus, and they follow Jesus, and they slightly tinker and modify some areas of their lives. No, they completely change direction because they have the right perception to say, I can trust him. He set me free. He really is God in the flesh. And he conquered Satan, sin, and death. And that's what happens there. They completely change their direction. So as we close, just want to give you a couple of questions. Maybe it might be helpful to write these things down and just evaluate it and think through some of these things. The first question is, Do I have some kind of misplaced hope? Chances are, if you're a human, you do. There's something that you thought would happen a certain way, and it didn't. Or maybe there's something in the future, but maybe it's not what God has promised you. Maybe you have some misplaced hope. What are those things? The second thing is, am I inviting God in? Remember we talked about, he, he, they actually invited Jesus with them. Yeah, he's going to be around you because he loves you. He's coming after you, even if you're walking away. But it wasn't until they invited him in that their lives begin to change. And the final thing is, does my heart burn within me? Did I slightly modify a couple of areas, or do I have white, hot, passion for the one, the perfect God who decided to come in human flesh as Jesus. And not go after the really great people that have everything together. He came for people like us. He came for the people that sinned against him. Jesus died a brutal death on the cross for his enemies. No one would do that, but Jesus did that for us. But not only that, he rose again on the third day. He said, anybody who puts their faith in me will have eternal life. I don't care what you've done, where you are, maybe what you're still doing, currently walking away. He wants you with him. And speaking of your heart burning within you, there was a story that reminded me of this. Um, In closing, final story is... Um, this came from this song um, called, I, ha- I, um, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. You ever heard that song, I've Decided? Love that song. It's a hymn, pretty old. Um, I used to, okay, just heard it, just heard the song. But when I heard the meaning of the song, it became a lot more impactful and where the song actually came from. So it kind of goes back in the early 1900s. There was this great revival happening in um, England. And from that, from that revival, because when it's a revival, it doesn't just stay there, it spreads. And these, these people who put their faith in Jesus, they wanted to go out and tell people. They wanted to go out and share that. So a lot of them um, got on the mission field and went to different countries. And there was one group that went to a northern remote tribe in India. And they decided, that they started to share in the gospel. And nothing was happening. This was a tribe that was not welcoming. This wasn't like, we're going to build something and everybody's going to love us and it's going to be great. We're going to give some candy to the kids. It wasn't that type of situation. This tribe was known as the headhunters, where they actually would um, cut off visitors' heads that they didn't like, hang them on the wall for decoration and as a warning to say, no, we're good. Like, 
We don't need your Western whatever. We, we're good. We don't need your religion. And that's what this tribe was. But they kept sharing the gospel. Nothing seemed to happen. And then there was finally one family, a man, wife, and two sons, that finally gave their life to Jesus. And they had a white-hot passion. Their heart burned for God. And they began to share it. They began to tell that to other people. And the word got out because more people were putting their faith in Jesus. And the, the tribal chief realized, okay, this is a threat. And then he, he captured them, pulled them in front of everybody's there, everybody's watching. They're basically going to have a trial. Um, renounce Jesus and I'll set you free. If not, I'll kill you. That's kind of how that trial is going to go. And so he, he says to the tribal chief, says to this um, father and husband, if you don't renounce Jesus, I'm going to kill your kids. And he loved his kids, obviously, but he knew, he read the scripture, he said, no, I can't deny Jesus. I can't. He's given me everything. I'm going to have eternal life with them. And so he said the first line that comes now to the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. And they said, okay, they got a bow and arrow, and the archers, they shot and killed his two sons right there before him. They fell and died. And the tribal chief con continues and says, well, okay, if you're not going to renounce Jesus, I'll give you another chance. Renounce Jesus or I'm going to kill your wife. And he obviously loved his wife and didn't want that, but knew he couldn't. And that's where another line in the song, though none go before me, still I will follow. And then so they pull the bows back and kill his wife. And then finally they turn to him again and say, if you don't renounce Jesus, we're going to kill you too. And he's looking at his family that's dead before him. And he has nothing left but Jesus and looks to heaven and says, the final line, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. And the man is killed. But the chief is so moved by this, and it's how we have the story that's recorded. The chief sees the devotion and the love and, and the passion that this family has for Jesus, this must be real. And he gives his life to Jesus, and then that begins to spread, and that's how we have the song that we sing today. And we all have that choice to come and decide to follow Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so thankful for you. We love that we get to decide. We have this life to make that decision. Are we going to follow Jesus or not? And Lord, help us to think through all the things. Maybe we had some unrealized expectations. We had some expectations of you that didn't come through. But we realize we trust you. And the Bible tells us that anyone who confesses Jesus as Lord, will be saved. And you are that close. You're with us. Lord, help us to make that decision today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.